colleagues, partners, brothers and sisters, we can say. I'm so happy to see uh, all of you in this uh, beautiful place. And uh, today we, ha we will have a very amazing, uh, indescribable event, actually, uh, which will be dedicated to some conversation between, uh, between two personalities. Uh, first of all, I, I would like uh, to express my honor to our dear guest and speaker. Yes, please, please take your, take your chair. Yes. Uh, our main guest and speaker is uh, Mahatma Shri Prem Prayojan Prabhu. He is a, a spiritual teacher and a writer. And uh, he did a lot of research uh, according to the psychology of yoga, according to the, uh, some uh, uh, modern and ancient philosophy. It's like uh, how we can compare modern and uh, ancient knowledge and uh, uh, mix it together and use and extract some significant principles of the religion, of spiritual life. And uh, from the other side, we have our official representative of some diplomacy world, we can say. It's a uh, minister of uh, uh, Mauritius, Republic of Mauritius, uh, our beloved friend, Mr. Roy. And uh, he was happy to join to our conversation and meeting and discussion, actually. And uh, we call our uh, meeting today like a requiem for doubts, because it's, <laughs> it will be like a uh, uh, discussion regarding some philosophical principles or of the beliefs of, of, of the uh, faith. Uh, that's why, after my introduction, I, I want to uh, give opportunity to do, uh, tell a few words to you, Your Excellency, and then Your Excellency, will, you will start with your questions, and all your exchange of your opinions will be subject matter of our discussion. Thank you so much. Please. Our friend Sergei has just uh, shown a video. And there it was uh, illustrated how there's a lot of confusion when it comes to philosophical and uh, theological issues. And throughout history, great teachers and great uh, philosophers have given a path, a way of training, whereby we can overcome our fallacious reasoning. You see, this is, the confusion comes from fallacious reasoning, from cognitive failure, from um, a mix-up of abstractions in our mind. And uh, once these cognitive failures are removed, then we can see very clearly um, some core principles, universal principles of spiritual life that uh, are manifest and have been shared by almost all the great thinkers throughout history. Um, it's very often uh, portrayed, the situation is often portrayed in such a way that all the great thinkers all totally disagreed with each other on everything. But really this is not the fact. There's, there was a very broad consensus on many fundamental issues and there are some differences on more um, aesthetic issues. So uh, today uh, I'd like to make a presentation looking at what I call theological structural realism or a, a scientific understanding of consciousness, the world and God and uh, how we can understand these subjects with the certainty. So we were discussing, this is the requiem for doubt, that doubt should be cast aside, and we should be able to know something really with, with certainty. So um, with those words, I'll hand the floor to our dear um, His Excellency, Dr. Rao. I, uh, Mahatma Shri Guruji, and it is a great honor for me to be here and uh, to listen to you. I will also be very happy to watch the video, small projection, 
which uh, shows how interfaith dialogue and uh, interfaith interaction and understanding is important. Because uh, what is sure is that the absence of knowledge, the absence of understanding breeds uh, violence, breeds misunderstanding, and breeds idea, negative idea on other people's thoughts and, uh, uh, and uh, behaviors and uh, way of thinking. Now, earlier you mentioned the work of the philosophe and of the great thinkers of the past who, as you say, we tend to believe that they disagreed. Well, when they agreed on some principle, on some basic principles, and me, I have been doing in my free time, when I'm not with Sergei, <laughs> doing some thoughts on, on uh, what's happening in the world. And uh, so, in my uh, belief, I am not uh, an authority, I'm only a student of history. I studied history a few years in France, little in the USA. And uh, but the passion of religion, the passion of philosophy, has uh, always drawn me to try to think. And uh, my first thing which I can see is that no man can know the knowledge is infinite. No one can know the mystery of the universe because the understanding, it will not surface even 1,000 lives if you could live. So we all in some places, we have limited knowledge. Whatever the mind, the greatest mind, you have people like Einstein, which I consider to be one of the most brilliant minds of this uh, of last century, and uh, if you talk to such persons as Einstein, they were very humble in their beliefs and uh, respectful of the belief of others. So who are we, you know, to to judge and put uh, and uh, bring um, judgment on others, on the beliefs of others? And when you go down in history. You will see that even if we have the accepted uh, religions, uh, all this with, say, Jewish, uh, we say Christian beliefs, we say Islam, before that we have Hinduism, we have uh, Buddhism, and, uh, and even before that we have other things which I will talk about. And if you the idea, for example, if we take something that is important in the in making, in molding the thinking of uh, the West, is the idea of one God, which stems from uh, Judaism. But even when you go to early people, you find, for example, in Sumer civilization, uh, you find in the Canaanite tribes before the Jewish tribes, uh, the, uh, as we know in the Bible, you find the idea of uh, one God in some population, in some tribes. So it was there. And then it evolved, and then we had uh, with the Old Testament, and then took form with Christianity, with Islam, and others. And so, even on one simple thing, you see, it's not so clear cut. Now, but, Your Excellency, what is your actually question? Because we should, uh, I should moderate our discussion. So my question, yes, my yes. question is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is uh, too it's complex to yeah. to understand. Yeah. And my uh, my thing uh, is not a question, but uh -huh. my aspect is the life of someone is not sufficient to know all the questions and all the answers. Yeah. So this is my uh, first thing. And second, I would like to talk on, on another point, but later on, for example, even in Russia, what's happening? Uh, in 1971, in the uh, Arctic region of Russia. They found some uh, evidence of uh, skeleton of uh, early human, mm. and then they said, "Okay, now we did it. 
civilization uh, starts 23,000 years ago. But it's completely another point, okay? Yeah. We'll touch this point also later. First, uh, uh, um, my proposal, we should move step by step. Okay. 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 First question, for example, if you have no uh, any so my question, like deep, deep philosophical yeah. question. If you have my question uh, is uh, to be in agreement with uh, mm. the... Ah, yes. The, uh, uh, Are you a believer or not? On, uh, I am still trying to believe. Okay. Uh -huh. it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, your open heart, open, open mind is uh, is enough. Yes. Uh, my proposal. Maybe we will start with one small presentation of you, and then we can discuss it yes, more deeply. Yes. Please. Thank you. What is the name of uh, of your presentation? Um, this is. Uh, let's see. Here we are. The synthesis of faith and reason. Uh, His Excellency just mentioned that we have to be humble yeah. because we're very limited in our powers, in our experience. This is true. But it doesn't mean that nothing can be known, that everything is uncertain. And especially uh, within, let us say, the uh, monotheistic conception God is unlimited, so we can never fully know Him. But because that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, He has the power to reveal Himself, to make Himself known to the finite soul. So the, our possibility of, of, of perfect knowledge it is not, doesn't lie with us, but it lies with grace. But we'll have to have some faith to begin with, in the existence of God in order to engage on the spiritual path of prayer and meditation that makes us open to receive that inspiration. Revelation. Revelation. So what I want to um, speak about today, I want to share with you, just don't mind if I stand up. Yeah, I don't mean to see overbearing, but I want to be energetic and move around. <laughs> I want to share with you some um, breakthroughs in philosophy. And uh, especially because, uh, as we've already we've touched on this point, that there's a there's an idea that everyone disagreed with everyone forever, yeah. and it's not really true. Now, uh, it's in the last few centuries, philosophers have had the chance because we have communication, we have travel, and everything. We're at a unique point in history uh, that. Uh, philosophers have had the chance to come together to deeply study and deeply try to understand what each side is saying and some wonderful core structures ideas have emerged in the recent years and uh, I gave a, a speech here last week uh, uh, touching on the fact that the great thinkers in Hinduism like Madhvacharya and in Judaism like Maimonides uh, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas in Christianity and uh, Avicenna in Islam they have very profound agreements on many important points so I'd like to extend that dialogue right up to the present day and update everyone so that you can be updated on the very latest breakthroughs in the interfaith dialogue and also on the analytical side of philosophy how things that were previously considered to be only matters of faith can now be understood with a very analytical, philosophical, mathematical precision, actually, with certainty. So um, there's a stage where, for the common person, we may see that his faith, he cannot fully justify it with reason. But there is a stage of development in our awareness, in our understanding, when our faith in God and our reason are in complete harmony with each other, so there's no room f for doubt. So, um, now before we begin the journey, it's going to be a journey today. <laughs> so, buckle in and get ready for the G-force. Yeah. So, before we begin our journey, it's necessary to bear in mind an important distinction. And that's the distinction between two types of theology. Natural theology, and revealed theology. So in uh, all the religious traditions they have a natural theology and natural theology is about what can we know on the basis of our own reason. Hmm? You see? 
So on the on the undeniable premises of natural order, there's order in the world. What can we deduce from that? So that is called natural theology. And then the other side of the thing of, of the discussion is revealed theology, and that is there are things which are beyond us, and so they're beyond our powers of argumentation. And uh, so, for example, an article of revealed theology would be something like. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, you cannot establish it by reason. It, it was a re something revealed uh, within that uh, religion. Or uh, Muhammad is the last prophet. Or God is a, a blue boy who plays a flute. So in, in Hinduism, Krishna. So these, these all reveal things. You cannot touch these things by reason. These are things which are only experienced by saints who have attained altered states of consciousness through prayer, through meditation, through penance. So those things are not available, they're not amenable to just a general person without a life of sacrifice and dedication, and they're definitely not amenable through the path of, of reason. So what we're doing today, uh, we're not uh, making, and I must say, that this is one of the main points of contention. Why does conflict come about, why is there disagreement? Because there's a, a, a face-off, let's say, there's a competition between on the one hand uh, reason and on the other hand revealed theology. These two are not compatible with each other. When you have a discussion between an atheist and a theist, it has to be on the basis of the um, natural theology, that is, what does the atheist understand through the investigation of reason, what does the theist understand through his reason, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's, the, that's the first point to understand. It's the difference between natural theology and revealed theology, and when we have a debate, the debate is, it's natural theology against atheism. Revealed the revealed theology is based on dogma. The, re, the revealed theology is just not amenable by, by reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yes, it's a, so don't make the competition between the revealed theology and uh, just an atheistic reason. It has to be between natural theology and atheism because we both share exactly the same criteria of discussion. Yeah. The criterion is not a mystical revelation. Yeah. The criterion is our own powers of reason that we agree. Yeah. So there has to be a common ground. Let's start with the common ground. Like a logical uh, way. Yes, yes. It, it's a logical way. So what we want to look at is that... Uh, we should not muddy the waters by pitting atheism against re revealed theology. Don't muddy the water. Natural, th natural theology uh, and atheism can have an exchange. So, um, now, there is a common per uh, perception that faith in God and reason are somehow opposed to each other. Yeah. So this misunderstanding is quite a modern phenomenon because it, we can show throughout history, and I'm sure you've studied the history, that throughout history, until quite recent times, faith in God was considered to be the, uh, a feature integral to the apex of human intellectual development. In other words, when a person was fully intellectually developed, then they had faith in God. It, that, that was part of it. And so... Um, in history, we can see from very ancient times in Greece, Heraclitus spoke about the intelligence behind nature, and he called it Logos, Logos. right? Yeah. And he also called Logos the just. There's a type of uh, uh, justice also in, in nature, in destiny. And then later, after Heraclitus, we have Plato. So Plato called the ultimate reality the form of the good. So now we have an ultimate truth, which is rational, which is just, which is good. Um, Aristotle called the supreme truth the prime mover. So now we have a God who is also all-powerful. Um, in Christianity, uh, God is referred to as our Father. And uh, the Hebrews, such as my mom days, called him Yahweh, the, the Creator, also all-powerful. In uh, Islam, Allah, the Great One. And in India, we have the schools of Nyai, logic. And in the logic school, the supreme truth, God is Ishwara, 
the controller. And that's also true for Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras. The, uh, in the highest me uh, yoga meditation technique is meditating on God in one's heart, Ishwara. Yeah. And then you have uh, the Bhagavan of the Bhagavad Gita, promoted by Madhvacharya, Chaitanya and others. So, we've looked at um, a broad consensus of great thinkers throughout history and uh, they agree on basic structure and what, and what we're discussing today is I'm presenting the idea of theological structural realism. There are a core set of ideas, there's a matrix of ideas at the heart of everything. Uh, so now I'd just like to introduce uh, also the scientific side. So from the scientific side we can call just as we've looked at some of the founding fathers of theology, of religious ideas, we could call these the, the, the th founding fathers of science. And uh, each one of these was actually theistic and, uh, and agreed upon the necessity of God's existence. So you have Copernicus, Kepler, um, here are all their areas of expertise. Isaac Newton, the laws of motion, gravitation, uh, Kelvin in thermodynamics, Einstein, all of these great personalities in science all believed that behind everything, the foundation of existence is some divine intelligence, God. And so, now, when we examine the conclusions of science and religion, we do find this consistent uh, matrix. So, what I want to look at, to have a discussion, we need to have some grounds of commonality, things that we all agree on. So, I want to look at four assumptions which are accepted by all theologians, which are accepted by all scientists, and which are even accepted by all atheists. So we can all sit at the table, whether you're a religious person, whether you're an atheist or a scientist or any combination of those three. Uh, there are some things that we agree on totally and then let's see if we can unpack what are the implications of those things that we agree about. Mm? So the first one is, of course, uh, the Scientists, theologians, and atheists all presuppose the validity of reason itself. Logical syllogisms, um, concepts that we think with, such as identity and difference, uh, the principle of non-contradiction, uh, the law of the excluded middle. These are all the components of reason itself, and we all agree on them. Right? There's no one who disagrees on these points. Second one. We all presuppose, uh, scientists, atheists, and theologians, that the world is real. Hmm? There are some philosophers who try to posit that the world isn't real. But scientists and uh, all the uh, main the theologians of the main uh, theistic religions, and uh, 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 scientists and the atheists, we generally agree the world is real, we're not dreaming. Right? Is anyone here just thinks that this is a dream? No, no. okay. No. We're all here. Okay, good. <laughs> so, we had this, our second point of agreement. The next one, uh, the third one is that we all propose that there are regularities in nature. And uh, because of these regularities in nature, nature is intelligible to us to a certain degree. It's that reality is sensibly uniform enough not to be so chaotic uh, to the point of being immune to our investigation. So we can investigate the world, there are regularities in nature, on the basis of this we can come to some conclusions. Then, the fourth uh, principle is the principle of uh, proportionate causation. Right? That, that cause and effect is in the world and, and the effects are proportionate to their causes. Right? If I've got $100 in my pocket, I can give you $10, $20, $30. If I have $100 in my pocket, I can't give you 
two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. Like an, an effect is always proportionate to the cause, right? If a if a, a really heavy person will hit the table, it may break. But if an ant will land on the table, nothing will happen. Cause and effect is there, and it's proportionate causation. All right. So here we are, and. Uh, you know, we were thinking that it would be a complete chaos and we'd all be in conflict, but we find ourselves already agreeing on everything, right? Okay, now, what I want to speak about is that on the basis of these four assumptions, which are shared by science, theology, and even atheism, we can derive all of the following truths of theological structural realism. That is, uh, we can know with certainty, just on the basic of, basis of these four things, we can know with certainty, one, that God exists, that God is eternal, that God is indivisible. That means He's irreducible, a simplex. He doesn't have parts. Uh, that God is singular, one. That God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, perfect, and good. These things. Now you, now, you may be wondering, well, how do we get from these four things that we all agree on to this profile of the Supreme Being? Right? That's why you're wondering. Okay, so that's, what we're, that's our subject today. We, we're going to, we'll come to that. The, the, the second thing that we can establish, simply extract as the implicit consequences of these four premises. We can deduce soundly uh, from these premises that the soul exists, that the soul is individual, that it is non-material, it's also like God, eternal and indivisible, irreducible, that the soul is dependent on God, that we are conscious and that we are agents, we have agency, we have free will, volition. The next point is that the world is real, that it is dependent upon God, it's distinct from our soul, the soul being spiritual and the world, the body and the world being material. And uh, it is distinct from God in essence, but not independent in existence. And also one other important point, that the temporary forms of this world are actually reflections. They have their prototypes, they have their origins in the transcendental forms, the eternal forms of a divine eternal world. So uh, you may be familiar with the idea of uh, Plato's idea of the cave, the shadows on the wall. Yes. That the world we're seeing is a shadow of a higher reality. Mm. Now, um, also the next point, that the purpose of this creation is to provide an opportunity for us souls to know God and be united with God in devotion and be united with God in such a way that we maintain our distinct identities because love means two. Right? Um, now, I want to introduce the basic axiom of uh, uh, TSR, TSR short for Theological Structural Realism, and that is that God is a necessary being whose existence cannot be denied without making a self-defeating statement due to cognitive failure. So if you can memorize just a sentence, it's <laughs> going to be really useful for you. You can just memorize that little aphorism, that sutra. Now, I'll just elaborate on it a little bit. What do I mean by a self-defeating statement? You can't deny God without making a self-defeating statement. What does that mean? So, um, a, an example of a, a self-defeating statement would be for me to say something like, I do not have a tongue. That's a self-defeating statement, right? <laughs> because if I didn't have a tongue, I would not be able to say it. So, um, that's a rather obvious example of a self-defeating uh, statement. But, in more profound discussions, about God and the soul, about existence and so on, then uh, you'll find that any attempt to deny the existence of God and the soul will actually be just as self-defeating as that statement, I don't have a tongue. <laughs> uh -huh. But the only difference is this, 
Where is this statement, I don't have a tongue, is obviously self-defeating. The statements that deny the existence of God or the existence of, soul, of the soul are not obvious to the speaker. Who said, If someone stands up and says, there is no God, it's not obvious to him. And the reason it's not obvious to him is because there's a psychological error involved in Sanskrit. That's called Brahm. A psychological error and a series of cognitive failures as well so um, what is necessary is that if someone has a, a, a atheistic opinion they have to be very introspective and try to search out within themselves what is the fundamental error and the series of cognitive failures which has brought them to the wrong conclusion which makes them fail to recognize the self-defeating nature of their own words and thoughts mm -hmm. you see so that's what we're going to look at today mm -hmm. we're going to look at the psychology the internal layers of cognitive failure um, and this is a very special contribution uh, that comes from uh, the Vedanta of India from the psychology of yoga as well so persons from other religions Christianity Islam and uh, Judaism whatever they'll also benefit so much from understanding these things so now one of the problems of philosophy is where do we begin what's the first principle what's the starting point so you know Rene Descartes he grappled with this and he came to a very famous conclusion. What was that, the starting point of René Descartes? If I think, I live. Yes, I think, the cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. At least, he thought, that if I'm not sure about anything, but there's only one thing I'm sure about, that I exist because I'm thinking. Right, okay, so he started from there. Now, in uh, theological structural realism, we have a completely different approach. Uh, if these principles are understood, you can start anywhere. Because it's a matrix of ideas that connects everything together. So once you understand it, you can begin from any point of discussion and within a few steps you'll arrive there at the uh, correct the theistic conclusion. So here we are. Where, where do you want to begin? We can demonstrate. M motion, we all agree that motion exists, things are moving, right? Motion, therefore God. Causation, therefore God. Consciousness, <coughs> therefore God. Uh, uh, qualia, you know, qualia is a philosophical term for the, um, our experience of things qualitatively. Uh, for example, the redness of a rose, or the, the sweetness of sugar. The, uh, the softness of the breeze. Uh, these are things that you cannot describe with mathematics. It's a uh, philosophical category. Yes, it's a philosophical category of our qualitative experience through our senses. Direct first person experience. Qualia, therefore God. Intentionality, therefore God. Reason, therefore God. Memory, therefore God. Language, therefore God. Meaning, therefore God. From any, any position, you can select any position and within a few steps, you will come to the uh, conclusion. So I'd just like to illustrate uh, some of these things. Let's start with, with motion, right? Things are moving everywhere. But when we examine, and all the great philosophers have uh, presented the same idea in their various languages, that if something is moving, it's always moved by something else, right? If you move the table, you moved it with your arms. Your arms were moving because of the muscles. The muscles were moving because of the, there's some mitochondria in the muscle. The mitochondria has, uh, can burn energy because you ate some food. And the food has energy because it grew from the sun. And you trace, most things go back to the sun. So, you see, everything that's moving is moved by something else. But the, the chain of, uh, of causation of mo motion must end somewhere it must end somewhere so that is the the prime mover in sanskrit that's called adhikarta the the first agent the first agent of motion and uh, there's no way to escape from that there's no philosophical escape from the uh, inescapable conclusion of 
ID card. That, uh, there must be a first agent. And that first agent is known among the people of the world as God. Or Adi Shakti? Mm, that is the, yeah, the energy of God which obeys his will, yes, in Sanskrit. Good, good point. Let's take, a, we can take another, we can take any of these. Um, oh, with motion, let's give another example. If you see a number of train carriages, you're standing at the train station, and there's a very long train, you're seeing the carriages, you look this way and this way as far as the eye can see, it's a very long train, it's moving. But you know that there has to be an engine at the front, otherwise they won't move. Why? Because there, there's instrumental causation between the end. Yes, one carriage is pulling the other, and that's pulling the next one, and that's pulling the next one. There's instrumental causation. But there are two types of instrumental causation, primary and secondary. And so a secondary type of instrumental causation means when the object itself is pushing another, but it does not have any independent power to push, you see, or to pull. So what you see with train carriages, each one is acting on the other as, an in, as a cause, but their causal power is all coming from one engine. And so the whole of reality is like that, that everything is dependent on an original cause, the Adi Karta, the prime mover. And the, one cannot escape from that. There have been some historical attempts to escape from uh, the conclusion of the prime mover. And uh, for example, some atheistic philosophers speak about entropy, that there's, a, that there's chaos in the universe, but where chaos is increasing in one place, it's going down somewhere else, and so the, uh, things move towards an equilibrium in one place, but then there's like this, and so they think that uh, the, the causation is circular. There's no original or first cause, but the causation is circular. But this is not an explanation. For example, if you make a circular train track, and put all the carriages on there and connect them to each other in a circle, mm -hmm. what will happen? Nothing will move. You see, even if it's circular, you still need an, a first, a primary instrumental cause. A connection of um, secondary instrumental cause will not produce anything. Um, so in, in, in Buddhist philosophy, interdependent causation is called pratitya sumutpada, and it's been uh, refuted thousands of years ago and uh, that, that brings us to a very important point and and one uh, famous philosopher said that those who don't know history are condemned to repeat it right if you don't understand history you end up making the same mistakes so we can also extend that and say those who don't know the history of philosophy will be condemned, condemned to repeat the history, history of philosophy. In other words, the same confusions will come again and again and again. The same ideas which have already been uh, discarded and disproven will uh, create confusion in humanity. And now in the 21st century, there's no necessity for that. Because we've all been in touch with each other everywhere around the world. We can see thousands of years of philosophy and we don't have to go around in circles again. Some things can be established as certain. Um, let's give another. Existence. Existence and God. Someone may say, well, I don't think that there's a first cause like you know, in the beginning there was God and he created the world. Because I think everything is eternal. Everything in existence is it's just always been here, so we don't need a creator, we don't need a first cause. But this is also not a, an answer. Why? Because there has to be a cause of existence, not in the beginning of a creation only, but there has to be a cause right now. Hmm? Right now. For example, our bodies are made of m m molecules, the molecules are made of atoms, the atoms are made of uh, electrons, protons, and they're made of quarks and gluons and bosons and all kinds of, and it goes down and down. There has to be something at the beginning of that chain of causation right now. Otherwise, we would all just disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, think If you think of, uh, uh, everyone agrees that the world is made of energy. So let's take, take the example of music. If a, if a violinist is playing music, that's the energy of the violinist. And we can all hear that music. But the moment he stops playing, the music stops. So in the same way, there, it's not that God is like a, 
uh, a watchmaker who makes a watch, puts it on the table and then disappears and he's like an absentee father and the whole world is just going on by itself. Reality cannot be like that. But rather, right now, the very existence of all things, moment by moment, must also have its foundational cause. And this, you, there is no, if someone can present a rational um, objection to that, please, please do, you can feel free. But it's actually not possible. Um, it's, if you will, you'll find that you have made some cognitive error. And we're going to be looking at some of the layers of con cognitive error coming up. So, let's look. Now, this is very, very fascinating. Let's look at intentionality. Intentionality. It's a feature of, of consciousness. We're all conscious and we have intentions at every moment. There's nothing that we do that isn't initiated by our intentions. Mm? I want to, whatever, be healthy. I, I want to earn some money. I want to find a friend. I want to discover the meaning of life. It, it, from the most simple things, I want to put on my shoe. You know, from, so from the most simple thing to the most uh, profound, mysterious, philosophical investigation, uh, there is something in common, and that is intentionality. Now, the wonderful thing about intentionality is this, that it's not ambiguous. It's determinate. Mm -hmm. If you say, if you think, I want to stand up, you stand up. It's, it's not ambiguous. You, when you think, I want to stand up, it doesn't also mean, I want to fall down or fly a kite or anything. It's, 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 it's a, a determinant one thing. Now consider this. If we are material beings, mm -hmm. as people, atheists, like to say, we are biological machines and the brain is like a computer. Right? Now consider this. That computers or any type of material apparatus deals with symbols. Symbols are being processed by computers. So let's just take a symbol. Here's a symbol here. There we are. There's a triangle. So, what does it mean? <laughs> Can anyone say? It, it, does it mean uh, this is the way to the camping ground? <laughs> is it a tent? Could be a tent. I think it's what she wants. Oh, it, it could be. Maybe it's a play button. Press play. <laughs> Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps it's a, it means free pizza for everyone. It's, it could be a slice of pizza. Perhaps it means it's, it's a hat. Is it a hat? Is it someone's birthday party? Perhaps it's a hat. You know, uh, when you look at any symbol, there's no such thing as a symbol that has a determinate meaning. It doesn't exist. Indeterminate. And let's say we write something. We write the letter A, B, C. The one, two, three. We use letters. If we wanted, we can change our mind and let's call this A, ah, and let's call this B. Let's give the let's give the numbers uh, different names, and, and and this can this could be one, this could be two. This so they only carry meaning because we agree on them, right? We agree on them. Uh, so there's no such thing as a determinant symbol. There are only indeterminate symbols. Now, let's say, if you are uh, of the opinion that your brain is just uh, like a computer. So you have neurons are firing, and the f they're either firing or not firing, so it's a binary computer. Computers only deal with ones and zeros, right? So what does one and zero, what does one mean? What does it, who decided what it is? Hmm? The fact of the matter is, and, and philosophers have discussed this, Especially, this is a, a development, especially in 20th century, late 20th century philosophy, of the proof of the immateriality of mind. That our mind, our uh, soul, our consciousness cannot be uh, material. It cannot be a physical machine because physical machines process symbols and there's no such thing as a determinate symbol. And because we have intentionality, which is always determinate, Therefore, we are not material beings. Beautiful. 
We are not material beings. And we've just proven it on the basis of things that we all agree, even if you're an atheist. You see, so these are some of the elements. I don't have time today to go into all of these things, but I promise you that every single one of these points, whether it's memory, language, meaning, quality of consciousness, they all lead to the existence of God. I'll just illustrate it with this one. Let's say, if we are ourselves not material beings, we're spiritual beings, and we're conscious, we have intentionality, but we find that our um, we are not... Uh, powerful. We are dependent. We ourselves have not created the world. We have not created ourselves. You see? So because of the law of proportionate causation, there must be a conscious being who is our source and who is all-powerful. Because it's not us, that's for sure. We didn't create everything. It's that we cannot even stop ourselves from growing old or becoming sick or uh, without food and water, we cannot live. If we stop breathing, we'll, we'll die. So we we are conscious, but we're conscious dependent beings. But be, we're not the cause of everything. But there is a cause of everything, and that cause must be conscious, because an unconscious thing, due to the law of proportionate causality, could not make a conscious being. So there there are many roots, uh, and in this uh, theory of theological structural realism, you can you don't have to try to struggle to find the first principle. You can begin the conversation anywhere you like. And within a few steps, you'll be directly there, understanding the nature of the material world, the soul, and the God as being certain realities. Um, so, I want to introduce one more, a very important point. Existence. Let's go from existence to God. Here's, a, here's an object. It exists. Now the question is this. Is it, and this is just a paradigmatical object, it could be anything. Is this object or this object divisible or indivisible? Divisible. It's divisible. So if you divide it and you divide it and you divide it, you have to stop somewhere. We, we discussed that before. You have to stop. So now, consider the place where you stop, that last thing, that last thing where you stop is indivisible. Right? The last thing. Now, what's the nature of an indivisible entity? We can say that this thing has a particular shape and particular characteristics because of the construction of its parts. But once you come down to the, an indivisible entity, you cannot use that explanation anymore. You have to... Now, have you considered philosophically what is the cause of the form or the nature or the characteristics of that which is indivisible? Aristotle calls it atom. Mm. That, which is, that which is indivisible cannot be, its, its nature cannot be caused by any parts because it has no parts. It must be self-existent. Hmm? It, it must be uh, the uh, self-existent. And being self-existent, its shape, its form, is a product of its own will. So when reality is a product of will, that is called omnipotence. Mm -hmm. You see? So in the Vedas it said, uh, Andanta rasta paramanu chayanta rastam. In the core of every atom of existence, God is present. You understand? So that uh, it takes some, you have to digest. It's not something that can be understood all at once. But if you meditate upon it, that which is indivisible, being the cause of its own existence, because its shape is due to itself, Therefore, reality is a product of itself, and that's the definition of omnipotence. So whichever direction you go, you'll find at the bottom of everything uh, an omniscient, omnipotent uh, God, the, the original cause of everything. So now, there are no arguments, what I'm saying today is that there are no arguments at all for atheism, because as soon as an atheist speaks, his statement is self Defeating. Why? Because in the very act of constructing a sentence, 
in the very act of constructing an argument, it entails consciousness, intentionality, memory, language, meaning, reason, causation. All the very things that confirm the existence of God are the precondition for Him composing an argument. And for this reason, there are no arguments for atheism. Now, why does a person not recognize the self-defeating na nature of his own speech? And that brings us to the point of uh, psychology. The, the root of philosophical atheism is not philosophical actually. The root of atheism is a psychological. Hmm? And we want to give some examples. For example, an, an atheist would claim something like the, the, the original cause of everything, the prime mover is not God, but rather we know that everything can be explained in terms of forces. And there are four forces that we know. What are the four forces from which everything is made? We have some scientists here today. Oh, fire, water, air. Uh, that's a little element. Uh, element. No, the the in 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 the realm of uh, modern science, you have four forces. They are gra gravitational force, right? Gravity, electromagnetism, and the the uh, strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. So scientists say that these four forces are the cause of everything. Uh, not that atheistic scientists, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. They say these four uh, forces are the cause of everything and they haven't been able to make, they have equations for each one but they haven't been able to put the four together, right? So they're, they're trying to come up with a, what's called a toe uh, and that's not like a toe like this but toe means theory of everything, <laughs> uh, the theory of everything, uh, wherein the, the, the equations that determine gravity and electromagnetism and the weak and strong nuclear forces could all be combined into one equation and until today, it's been completely impossible. It, 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 it's baffled them. They, it's, it's as if uh, the, the journey has come to a brick wall that's uh, a complete impasse. Okay, so this is their idea. Now, we want to demonstrate how such an idea is irrational and it is the result of cognitive failure. So we're going to be looking at the anatomy of uh, cognitive failure. So here we go. Um, now, the scientific methodology begins with observation, right? We start with observation. Now, people tend to think, well, I'm just observing something, I'm being impartial. But the, um, the philosophers of science, they all agree today that observation is theory-laden. You cannot look at anything without being full of theories already. And so what happens is even in the stage of observation, there's what's called uh, loading and framing. That you're already framing your observation in a narrative and loading it with qualities that you're projecting there that you actually have no evidence that they exist. So that's the first part, observation. Then the next thing is operationalization. That when you observe something, you want to understand it in science. You have to uh, make some measurements and then you'll see the, the ratios between the measured variables and so on, so that you can use your observations to achieve something, discover something, okay? Operationalization. Now, in the act of operationalization, you have to do um, abstraction. In other words, you, you have a piece of paper and you're gonna write down your theory on the piece of paper. Now, your theory on the paper and the object itself are two different things. That's the object in the concrete world, and on paper, that's your abstraction. Very interesting things happen when the human mind does abstractions. We're going to be looking at that. That's called, in, in Sanskrit, abstraction is called vikalpa, or non-correlated thought construct. A, a construct of thoughts in your mind which actually doesn't exactly correlate with the concrete world. Then, what happens is on the basis of abstraction, then a person will formulate equations and then uh, on the basis of those equations they'll come up with an idea of what is the, the cause of a particular phenomena 
and they'll say, okay, th now this theory, this law, this scientific law is a concrete reality. So uh, causatization, concretization, and agentization. Now this law is the cause of whatever is happening. Agentization, it's the cause of the action. Okay, so that's, that's an overview of the stages of cognitive failure that happen. Scientists do it all the time without knowing because it requires profound self-reflection to see your own mind. Only those who practice meditation, those who are uh, deeply absorbed in prayer, they develop this state of objective self-awareness towards their own uh, mental movements. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and the more a person is engaged in a kind of material life, just eating, drinking, and smoking, and just trying to enjoy, then what happens is a grossification of the intelligence takes place, and we lose objectiveness in relation to our own thoughts. You see, and so uh, this is why uh, those who are engaged in the religious life, they tend to be able to go deeply into these ph philosophical things because the life of austerity, of penance, of self-control brings about uh, a, a great refinement of the psychological, of the intellectual faculty. And the materialistic life causes a grossification of the intellectual faculty whereby uh, it's like, uh, what could we say, it would be like um, trying to uh, type on, a, on, on your phone with big gloves on. You know, <laughs> just can't do it. The mind, so your mind becomes like that kind of gross and you cannot do the, these very subtle operations. So let's look, I'm going to look now at uh, just these um, levels of cognitive failure. Whoops, wrong button. There we go. So first, observation. So the first thing is, when a, a scientist looks at an object, he thinks that this object is self-existent. Now we've already established that there are no self-existent objects. Everything is a dependent existent. So the, the vision, the observation is already theory laden from the beginning. This thing exists all by itself. Right? And, uh, and also uh, it's functioning according to mechanistic laws which are blind. So these are some of the, uh, that's, that's the root psychological error. It's called in Sanskrit, Swatantra Sataya Brahm. The mistake of imagining that the objects around us have their own independent existence and that there's not a cause behind them, let's say the, the God, the musician, who's keeping the music of life going at every moment. You see? So then, uh, the next stage, oh, I just want to mention that this uh, idea that observation itself is theory laden and uh, we are framing things before we even start that that appro atheistic approach of science is itself not impartial it's partial from the very beginning this has been presented by the, the top philosophers of science Paul Feyerabend uh, in his book Against Method and by Thomas Kuhn in his famous uh, uh, thesis The Structure of Scientific Revolutions so what I'm saying, it's not only from, say, Thomas Aquinas or Aristotle or, or Vyas or the Vedas. It's recognized by the top um, philosophers of science today. Then, the next one. Oops. Here we are. Operationalization. So we have to start measuring things. Now, when we start measuring things, what do we do? We only take quantitative characteristics, right? So if I were to give a, a, a description of uh, uh, our Raj Kumar here, I could say he's, what, uh, six foot one? Yes, six yeah. foot two. Six foot two, okay. <laughs> so he, he's six foot two. Let's write it down on a piece of paper, six foot two. And he's about uh, 85 kg? No, 79. 79, okay. <laughs> 79 kg. Uh, we can write that down. Uh, there is other things we can, we can add some other measurements there. These measurements are abstractions. Even all these measurements together are not the same as the concrete person who is there in the world. So what happens, and this is very important to understand, in the act of operationalization, in the act of abstraction, we take, we take some qualities, not qualities actually, no qualities, only quantities. We abstract quantities and we leave all the qualities behind. Uh, we cannot write uh, you know, 
about, uh, we cannot mathematically describe, the redness of his lips, uh, the piercingness of his eyes, uh, the, the beauty of his smile. We, we cannot do this. So the qualitative things are left behind. Only the quantities come. Now what's really, really amazing is that in our abstract model, not only is it different from the concrete reality because we've left some qualities behind, but in the act of abstraction, you actually introduce qualities inadvertently without noticing which are not there in the real world. Huh? How do you do that? Let's, let's give it just a little example. Okay, here we are. Here's a graph. We're, we're discussing about the speed of a car. So here's our time, here's our time axis here, and here's our distance axis here. So uh, the car started here, and then it, uh, there you go, it accelerated, okay? So now what we've done, the, we have the real world thing, a car is accelerating, and we've done our operation observation, operationalization, abstraction, and we're formulating our equations now. Uh, speed is distance over time, right? Okay, so there we go. Now, you've left something behind because the color of the car, the weight of the car, the driver of the car, nothing is there. But have you added something to the reality which wasn't there? Have you added something? Yes, so many things have been added. First of all, uh, let's say uh, time. Here, here we have the time axis. What is time? Do you know? Is it something that you've seen? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Mm -hmm. What is time? Other than movement, now all the great philosophers, Thomas Aquinas and, and in India, Aristotle, others, they say that time actually doesn't exist. There's only movement. Things are moving, and when we see the rate of something movement, our mind creates this idea that this thing called time. And now what we've got is we've abstracted something here. We've made time into its own entity that we all somehow exist within, and we're moving through this medium called time. But it's Maybe not. It's measure while we're existing. Huh? It, it's the way that we abstract uh, about our experience of motion, right? Now, we've added so many other things here, because here's our time axis, let's see, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. Do you notice something else about time? On your graph, every moment exists at the same time, right? The past and the present and the future all exist simultaneously on the graph, but in real life, that's not a fact in the concrete world, right? Let's have another thing. We've thrown in something else here by accident. Time is symmetrical. In other words, on paper you can go forward in time and backwards in time, it has no direction. I just put that arrow there myself. Yeah. But in, in science, when they make a graph and they, and they discuss time, then we find that, that actually, look, on paper it's symmetrical, it's not directional. Yeah. There's no north and south to time, you see? And so by on paper then you think, well, well, maybe I could make a time machine or something. We could go back in time. But in real life, and uh, what to speak in, in, the, in the theory of relativity, nothing is allowed to go faster than the speed of, of light. And in, the, in quantum mechanics, time definitely cannot go backwards because once uh, there is the, uh, the uh, collapse of the wave function, it's, you cannot undo it. So in real life, in the concrete world, time is not symmetrical. Uh, it's not uh, symmetrical at all. So I'm just giving a very simple example how in the act of uh, abstraction and formulation, not only does the scientist leave things from the real world out of his equation, but he also adds things which are also not there. You see? So then, the next, uh, the next level is, and, and uh, now what we're talking about here, these are cognitive failures, doing things by accident without noticing them. These are layers of cognitive failure. So let's go to the next one, the causatization. Okay, so this is really beautiful. The, uh, 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 an atheist may say, well, everything is just forces. So there are different kinds of forces. We'll just use a general equation for force, just as an illustration. But the illustration just will apply uh, uh, to in, in other cases as well. Is it? So everyone knows that force is what? Mass times acceleration. 
Eh? If you have something that's a certain weight and it accelerates at a certain speed, then you know that a certain force has moved it. Right? This is what we know. Now notice something here. That the force is, uh, um, is defined in terms of mass times acceleration. Right? So let's say I'm standing here and I'm whatever, 66 kgs, and, some, and someone, you come and you push me, and I fly off at the acceleration of whatever, 9 meters a second, something like that, okay? So here's my mass here, here's my acceleration, and who pushed me? You, you pushed me, okay? Now, if someone else will come and push me in exactly the same amount, the mass and the acceleration become, is the same, but the actual thing that committed the force was something totally different. You see? So what you have here in this equation is the force is not really being explained. It's only being defined in terms of the effect. Right? So, in other words, the force is anonymous. If you push me or you push me or you push me in the same way, right, the equation would be exactly the same. But F, the force, would be you, you, it would be a completely different person. So in the mathematics, the force actually remains anonymous, so you haven't explained what the force is. Actually, it's anonymous. And it's being defined only in terms of the effect. So when a person says, oh, the world is just made of these forces, well, you say, what are the forces? Well, the forces are uh, this effect. What have they done? In their mind, they've just switched. You've switched effect to cause. Hmm? So I could say, well, you know, who, who pushed me? Who pushed me? And you'll, you'll say mm, 67 kilos times 9.5 meters per second, right? But that's not what pushed me. You pushed me or you pushed me. So there was something there. It's, it, it's not anonymous. But what happens is um, a person very easily does this thing which I'm calling here causatization. We know that the world is made of forces. What are forces? The effects. You cannot say that the effects are the cause. But you just said it because you didn't notice that you've done this act of causatization, switching the effect for the cause, and that is another level of cognitive failure. Beautiful. Okay? Is it everyone on the same page? Yes. Let's go a bit further. Um, now, the next one is called the concretization. That means this abstract force, which is completely anonymous, but on paper you write it down. The force is F. There it is. Now this force on paper is self-existent. Hmm? There's nothing behind this symbol on the page making it exist forever. Uh, in, at least in your abstraction, on the page. It's a self-existent entity. So now you've just inserted self-existence into a cause. It wasn't even a cause, it was an effect. And you totally didn't notice that you did it. These are layers of cognitive failure, which are, in Sanskrit they're called pramadda. Pramadda, uh, sorry, vikalpa. Um, yeah, cognitive failure is called um, uh, pramadda, that's cognitive failure. And the actual individual cognitive failures are called vikalpa, or non-correlated thought constructs. You have a thought construct, but it's not correlated to the external reality. Okay? So then, the next thing is agentization. Now you say, well, uh, everything is moving because of this force, but this force, as we already understood, was anonymous, and it was an effect. You don't really have an agent, but you've just made it into the cause of everything that's going on. And that's the next level of uh, cognitive failure, agentization. Now, I'll give an example. Here's a famous book. It's a best-selling book. And this best-selling book by uh, uh, the scientist Peter Paul Davis, sorry, no, Peter Atkins, Paul Davis gave the comment. This book is a joy to read. Peter Atkins wrote the book. It's called Four Laws That Drive the Universe, and the book is about uh, the law, the, the four laws of thermodynamics, right? And basically, what Peter Atkins did was he went through all of these six stages of cognitive failure without noticing and wrote a book to catalogue and make an exhibition of his own <laughs> cognitive failures. No, no. no, he wrote it to enlighten everyone that the, that the universe is driven by these four laws. Uh -huh. Now, 
um, there was a, a very wonderful scientist, the top scientist, one of the top scientists in the world in the uh, subject of thermodynamics. And he said, well, look, these laws are a description. And descriptions don't drive anything. Right? If you say, oh, this car is moving at 60 miles an hour, and I ask you, but what's driving the car? You say, 60 miles an hour. <laughs> that's, that's not an answer. Yeah? A description is not a dis uh, it does not explain causation like that. So one, uh, one top scientist from Israel had to write another book, and this was his book, Four Laws That Do Not Drive the Universe, by Arya Ben Naim. So it's a, it's a very interesting book. And he shows scientifically how the first book, which was a bestseller, and I'm not kidding you, millions of people all over the world read that book and thought it was the best thing ever, and it completely explains everything about the world, and uh, that there's no necessity of God. Uh, but a scientist in the same field wrote another book refuting everything, and uh, what I'm presenting uh, today is the, the mature combination of all the philosophical main th ph philosophical <coughs> points of the great thinkers from the East and the West, along with a psychological analysis of the defects in the atheistic interpretation of science. We like science. Science is wonderful, but we have to interpret it correctly. Otherwise, we'll, we'll come to a wrong conclusion. If you come to the conclusion that there's no God, and then when we, when we die, that could be really problematic. You know? <laughs> Just like you know, John Lennon said, imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell and, and no God and everything. But then God said, imagine there's no John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> And then, like that. So it's and and then what happens to you? You see. So it's really important that we know that we are souls and that there is a God, and try to become connected in our loving relationship with God. So I'm I'm very very uh, impressed. Thank you for paying attention. I'm almost at the end now. Just one or two points. And so there we are. There's a there are the seven actually seven uh, stages of uh, cognitive failure. So, now, one may say, why have scientists themselves not unpacked these implications? So in 1936, Einstein, in his uh, paper called Physics and Reality, he wrote, it has often been said, and certainly not without justification, that the man of science is a poor philosopher. Einstein himself said, wow. the man of science is a poor Why? Because he's so invested in the techniques, in his, in his methodology, that it's very easy to lose um, objectivity. And, and it's easy to lose um, awareness of the limitations of that technique. Um, so, uh, but we have, a, we have a, a situation today where many people proudly say, uh, Scientia locuta cosa finita, you know? In, in, in Latin, there, there was a time in history when if there was an argument about something, then they would ask the Pope. And then when the, when the Pope gave the conclusion, then he, they would just say, Roma locuta cosa finita. Rome has spoken, the argument is finished. So now we have a situation where people are literally saying, Scientia locuta cosa finita, science has spoken, the argument is over, there is no God, everything is materialistic and everything. But as you can see, the uh, discussion is far from over. So it's very important that these ideas, they should enter into the educational system. Uh, students should study this so that they can be inoculated against the misconceptions that lead society down the path of atheism and away from the path of morality. because. Uh, without faith in God, then the soul becomes corrupt, immorality takes over one's life, and the result is simply misery, misery for everyone. So, uh, today we've shown that uh, there are no arguments for atheism. Uh, their only tactic is to defer and ignore. Oh, we'll, we'll know later, we'll discover the answer to this later, later. And um, now, our last point, uh, that is that And this was something brought up by your video. 
You know, when general people come together, they often argue, they often disagree, and it's, it's, it, it's very problematic. So the question comes, how does a common man arrive at a correct conclusion? Okay, so there are two, two ways. One is to follow the series of logical steps. And today we've been through some of those logical steps, and I'm sure you all agree that it's actually quite demanding, right? It's quite philosophically demanding. It's like, who's got time to really uh, come to that by himself? It's, it's quite difficult. And then the other way that a, pers a, a common man can arrive at a correct conclusion is by receiving the conclusion from a trusted authority. If a trusted authority said, look, we've done all the studies, and we found that there's a God. The God is going he can, he can accept. These are two ways. Now, even though he might not be able to give all the, all the steps, the philosophical steps leading to the conclusion, the important thing is that a person is correct. That has a right conclusion. Now, one study. Have you heard of the, there's a psychologist? His name is Solomon Ash. So Solomon Ash did psychological studies in conformity. It's a very interesting subject. What he did was, he brought people into a room, and there was a ball, a white ball, and he asked them, what color is that ball? And they would say, oh, it's white. Okay, just two minutes. Uh, what color is the ball? The ball is white. Another person, the ball is, it, it's very simple. But then they did something else. They had uh, actors, but the person who comes in the room doesn't know that the other actors, he thinks that they're subjects just like himself. And he stands at the end of the line, and then the scientist asks, what color is this ball? And the actor says, oh, it's white, sorry, it's black. He says, it's black, and the next one person says, it's black, it's black. And by the time it's, and that person's looking, and he's doubting himself, and he's rubbing his eyes, and he gets to it, and he says, oh, it's black, it's black. So it, it was actually demonstrated that not ev this didn't work with everyone, but 75% of the subjects said that something that was white was black, <laughs> due to everyone else saying the same thing. <laughs> this is called the conformity experiments in psychology. So this is a very serious problem in the world. It means that 75 and actually these were all college-educated males, college-educated males. So among the general populace, the, the, the number is quite, it must be much higher. But 75% of the people who were tested did not have their own independent powers of critical thinking. You see? And that's why it's important for leaders of society to give through education, through media, through art, through all avenues the proper guidance to the people about the truth of the existence of God and the spirituality of the soul. And then those who have critical thinking will come to the conclusion by themselves and those who don't will go along because everyone else is going along like that. And that will be very beneficial for society. So my final uh, uh, word is that it's essential for the spiritual health of the nation that government, education and media collaborate together to lead people in the right conclusion. And by adopting this theory of theological structural realism, the state, the nation, can be simultaneously both secular, because these are common ideas to every religion, secular and also theistic. Because right now the, the choice is between atheistic, secular, or theistic, but uh, sectarian. So this is a presentation that gives the possibility of the theistic secular state. And that will advance the stability, the healthy morality, and facilitate the perfection of life for all citizens. So thank you very much for your opinion.